Okay, I'm attempting to do a video on the road from the hotel room. Uh, this video is kind of a go-between from working with the crystal set and starting to uh, study different diodes that we might use in the crystal set. Uh, we have to go through a little bit of uh, atomic physics and uh, find out what uh, the various types of diodes are. And uh, this is the boring one that you want to skip, by the way, before you go to the next video where we start to work with different diodes and do some biasing of the diodes. So um, prepare for some uh, interesting uh, physics explanations about electrons and things like that. But uh, it'd be nice to understand what diodes are and uh, how we can use them and bias them uh, to make uh, better crystal sets. Now, this video, I'm using a very simple camera. It's an old... Uh, Kodak PlaySport. It's one of the very early 1020p cameras that uh, was supposed to be able to be used underwater a few feet. Um, I'd say it's about 10 years old, so this is a small chip. It doesn't have very good light capability, so we're kind of at the mercy of uh, some low, low resolution equipment, but I hope this works out. Let's talk about diodes a little bit. We'll start with some physics. And physics is kind of boring. It's controversial, not really well understood. Sometimes it's even wrong. But to understand our crystal detector, we first have to start with metals and understand why they conduct electricity. I'm talking about common metals like copper, aluminum, silver, gold, and so on. Like all materials, metals are made of atoms that have a nucleus and electrons in the orbits around it. They're also easily uh, forming ions and they can combine to form compounds and so on predicting the direction that the electrons would move within a conductor. It just means you uh, have charge interactions. Opposites attract, likes repel. Let's say uh, some methods used to impart a negative charge to an object at a given location. At the location where the charge is imparted, there's an excess of electrons. That is, a multitude of atoms in that region possess more electrons than protons. Remember that protons are in the nucleus, along with neutrons and so on, right? There's a number of electrons that could be thought of as being uh, content since there's an accompanying uh, positive charge proton to satisfy their attraction for an opposite. The bonds between the atoms to form the metal and keep it all together are made orbiting electrons. You know, the metal has some so solidness to it and uh, you can bend it, and, but it, it stays together, it doesn't fly apart. We know that there's contentment when you have a positive, or when you have the same number of electrons as you do protons. Now in metals, the outer electrons, called the valence electrons, are weakly held. In metallic bonds, the valence electrons, the outer orbits, they delocalize. That means they can move. They're very easy to move along. That just means instead of orbiting their respective nuclei, they form a sea of electrons that surrounds the positively charged atomic nucleus of the interacting metal ions. So we have a lot of loose electrons flowing around. They can be easily moved by energy. What kind of energy? Almost anything you can think of. Radiation, uh, charge, RF energy, magnetic fields, pressure, heat, light, you name it, you can get these electrons to move. And how fast does it take? It's, it's darned fast. It's like a chain reaction. And uh, there's no memory or hysteresis either. Those electrons move right along. Okay, let's talk about insulators, non-conductors, insulators. Uh, the valence shell of an atom can contain up to eight electrons. If they're all filled, that's an insulator. The conductivity of an atom depends on the number of electrons that are in the valence shell. When an atom has only one electron in the valence shell, it's almost a perfect conductor. When the atom has eight valence electrons, basically it's complete. The outer ring is complete and the atom is an insulator. Therefore, conductivity decreases with an increase in the number of valence electrons. Materials that do not conduct are termed insulators like glass, porcelain, plastic, rubber. The covering on electrical wires, for instance, is an insulator. They don't conduct because they have a full or nearly full valence shell. If a high enough voltage is applied to an insulator, the force is so great that the electrons are literally torn from the parent atoms. 
Sometimes we call that a flashover or an arcover. The atomic bond is, is based on uh, shared electron pairs and nonmetals in a rigid grid pattern. We sometimes call that a crystalline structure. The elements which behave like nonmetals have a desire to catch electrons. Thus, there's no free electrons which might serve as charge or current carriers. Remember, we've got electrons and we've got holes. The holes want to get to the electrons. The electrons want to get to the holes. And we've learned about conductors. We've heard about, heard about uh, insulators. So let's learn about semiconductors. Remember that a good conductor has one or two valence electrons. And an insulator has eight valence electrons. A semiconductor might have four. It's neither a good conductor nor a good insulator. Examples are germanium, silicon, and uh, believe it or not, carbon. They're going to be making semiconductors and they uh, are experimenting already with making semiconductors out of doped diamonds, believe it or not. Uh, you might have heard of selenium. Selenium is kind of interesting because it has six valence electrons, but it can be compounded to have two or four. Thus, you can make a semiconductor out of it fairly easily. Okay, so in summary, if the atom has more electrons than protons, it will have a negative charge and become a negative ion. If the atom has more protons than electrons, it will have a positive charge and become a positive ion. Silicon or germanium are pure intrinsic semiconductors, meaning they conduct some, but the addition of a small percentage of foreign atoms in the regular crystal lattice of silicon or germanium produces a dramatic change in their electrical properties. And you can make n-type and p-type semiconductors. These impurity atoms, for instance, with five valence electrons, produce n-type semiconductors by contributing extra electrons. Arsenic, for instance, is one of the, uh, one of the uh, atoms that's used to present those five valence electrons as a doping agent. Impurity atoms with three valence electrons produce that p-type material, semiconductor material, by producing extra holes or electron deficiencies in the atom. Aluminum, for instance, is a good dopant to produce a p-type material out of either silicon or germanium. So n-type material has extra electrons over the intrinsic material, the natural material, the material as it is seen in the periodic table. And the p-type has extra holes beyond the intrinsic or the natural material. This adds to the energy level of the material. When you put these two together, you form a band gap, the p and the n. This band gap that's formed when you put the p and the n together can be excited to allow current to flow. Because the band gap is so small for the intrinsic semiconductors, you need to dope them with small amounts of impurities that dramatically increase the conductivity of the material. If you were just to put the, the P and the N type material, uh, natural material together, but by doping with the small amounts of impurities, we can increase the conductivity of the material. Doping therefore allows us to easily change the conductivity of any semiconductor. The PN junction is a transition area between P and N doped semiconductor crystals. In this area there are no free charge carriers since the free electrons of the N conductor in the holes of the p doped crystal in the vicinity of that interface begin to recombine with each other and uh, you end up with, with a uh, satisfied area where you have electrons and holes that are totally at rest. That means that the electrons have filled the holes. This is called diffusion. In this area, there are very few unfilled holes or free electrons. Both of them are considered charge carriers, by the way. Either hole flow or electron flow is charge flow. Thus, we call this zone the depletion zone. So with this depletion zone sandwiched between the N material and the P material, one that wants to give up electrons and one with holes wanting to receive electrons, a potential of some amount is needed to get conduction to start to overcome that gap. For silicon-based PN junctions, this potential is typically 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 volts. For germanium PN junctions, the depletion zone gap requires about 
uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 volts to diminish it or overcome it. Essentially, we have created a device that when turned on will conduct electricity, but in only one direction. If a positive voltage is applied to the P-material side and the return or the negative is applied to the N-type side, the mobile charge carriers are continuously delivered, holes one way, electrons the other, and current flows. In the reverse bias condition, the depletion region becomes engorged or enlarged and thus it exhibits a huge amount of resistance. So a PN junction diode when operated in reverse bias condition acts as an open circuit. There is some leakage so you can't call the device purely unipolar and uh, we'll see how that leakage affects the, uh, the quality of our detector when we get back into our crystal radio in the next video. So let's talk about the uh, shock key diode. So the shock key diode is a completely different beast. In the shock key diode the junction is actually between n-type semiconductor and a piece of metal. The shock key barrier diode has electrons as majority carriers on both sides of the junction. So it's pretty much a unipolar device with electrons flowing. It gives a very low voltage drop across that junction. In other words, the for forward voltage drop is less compared to a normal PN junction type of diode. In the shock key barrier diode, the current conduction is happening due to the movement of electrons only. There's no hole movement in the opposite direction. Thus, there's less delay that will happen. This is kind of like uh, muscle memory. When you're moving electrons and holes around, there's a certain amount of friction that occurs inside the material. If one side is made of metal and the other is a semiconductor, that's going to be a faster diode. So Schottky diodes are by nature faster diodes than PN junction type diodes. When the Schottky diodes forward bias, the conduction electrons in the end layer blast across the junction and enter the metal. Since these electrons plunge into the metal with huge energy, they're generally known as hot carriers. That's where the term uh, hot carrier diode comes from. The metal side acts as the anode and the n-type semiconductor acts as the cathode of the diode, meaning conventional current can flow from the metal side to the semiconductor side, but not in the opposite direction. This shock key barrier results in both very fast switching and low voltage drop. The combination of metal and semiconductor determines the folded forward voltage of the uh, diode. We only mention n-type, but both n and p-type semiconductors can develop shocky barriers. Actually, uh, p-type has a much lower forward voltage. So if you were designing, say, a ZBD or a zero bias diode or a zero bias shock key, you might be tempted to try to use p-material to make your shocky diode. So anyway, we've gone through some of the physics of the uh, metal, insulators, semiconductors, doping, the PN junction, and uh, finally the shocky diode. And I think we're, uh, we're just about ready to uh, get back into the uh, crystal set with the next video. Now that you're loaded with all this information, we have to think about the old cat's whisker detector or the razor blade detector, or some of the other early carborundum type detectors. And I'm going to leave you with a question. What type of diode do you think they are? Do you think they're a PN junction diode? Or do you think they are a shock key type? I realized I was going pretty fast with the uh, explanations, and there's probably a bunch of mistakes thrown in there. But the idea is just to get a good feel for how diodes work what the PN junction is and what a shocky diode is so we can go on to the next video which should be a little bit more enjoyable.